you will proceed out this door and hopefully everybody has umbrellas because it's raining. But right now you'll go out, you have to go away from the building, 75 feet. So that means that we go on the other side of the uh, head. Uh, uh, so that if the, if the emergency bell rings, that's where you're going. And then in the event that you need to use the facilities, you go out this door and to the left instead of the right. There's a hallway there to the right and the men and women's restrooms all right there. Okay. And my name is Janice Hall, and I am the manager of the Business and Institutional Management Office, and the Human Systems Academy resides in my office. And my secretary, Louie Guerra, and uh, our admin officer, Dietra Emmons, are my assistants in doing this lecture. So, are you all ready? I'm bringing Chris along. Yes. Okay. Service, so. okay. I'm holding Dick's microphone, so. <laughs> Stand next to me, your brother. Okay. So, uh, well, welcome for, for this uh, talk. Uh, I re imagine that many of you are here in part for several reasons. Perhaps you wanted to learn something about how the crew health and safety Im is impacted by sound, by acoustics, and perhaps uh, during this talk we'll be giving you some understanding of some of the standards that you're working with, uh, some of the requirements that come through. That would be reasonable. Perhaps you just have an interest in crew health and safety as part of the academy, which is a great program. Uh, that's our intention today. I think I'm advancing the slide, so Chris, stand back here with me. Chris is holding my microphone today. He's a very handsome microphone holder. <laughs> this is our agenda. Uh, we'll be, after we do introduce Chris Allen, who is the lead from SF um, and Acoustics and the Acoustics Office, as well as the Acoustics Noise Control Laboratory, which you'll have an opportunity to visit, I believe, next Tuesday. Oh, Thursday. 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 This Thursday. Thursday. You'll hear more about Definitely that later. Yeah. Last slide to get the details correctly. Uh, Chris is going to outline some issues that describe some of the more fundamental engineering aspects and noise measurements and noise controls that have been implemented for us in spaceflight um, issues. Um, I'll grab it next and I'll talk about how it's impacting on crew health and safety. And we'll pass it off to Jose Lamardo. Uh, Jose is the assistant lead in the acoustics office. My role is to be your audiologist here at JSC. Um, I have an office in the clinic and then am a part of this acoustics working group. So that should outline your agenda. I'll save the time for the outline. At the end of it, we'll describe the details of how this acoustics noise control laboratory business will work, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with that later. So how is, uh, from uh, some of you, you might be assuming that noise is uh, an issue regarding hearing loss or that their crew members are losing hearing. Uh, there really are many other important reasons for crew health and safety that pertain to why we're looking at and are interested in reducing or mitigating noise exposure. Ideally, first with noise controls, as Chris's group works on, noise measurement to identify what that risk is, and then I'm turning it over to uh, the flight surgeons and to me to deal with uh, crew issues for monitoring their hearing health. But this slide identifies uh, four other, five other reasons for why we're interested in noise, not just because of hearing loss. Think about it. Um, you've had situations where speech intelligibility at a party or in a machine shop, or in a noisy vehicle, or an airplane, has interfered with your ability to, dis to talk calmly or clearly in terms of speech intelligibility with the person who's sitting one row across the aisle from the aircraft. This situation could be applied to our ISS. It could also affect crew audibility of important caution warning signals. Uh, if your cell phone was turn to the vibrate mode and you weren't really sure where it was, you're trying to find the, to localize it in your home or whether you're actually receiving a text message or a phone call, that could be an implication for you in terms of the importance of being able to hear a caution warning alarm. Or if you were in a noisy place and it really was something to exit the building, that'd be important as well. So you can imagine that's how it affects our crew. Also, we're interested in disruptions of sleep. If you've ever rented a, a hotel room that was noisy too close to the elevator, or had a barking dog from a neighbor that was disturbing your sleep and maybe makes you sleepy today, you can imagine how that would impact when our crew is doing some very important and critical um, tasks for their job. And then finally, just interfering with crew task performance due to noise. If in fact this wasn't a nice recording studio with a good sound and limited signal to noise ratios, that if there was in fact some operating, some vacuum clear going on, or, there, or you maybe had one of the noisy buildings here 
at JST that has HVAC noise that hums and roars down and you've had difficulty hearing around the corner or someone else in another cubicle, you've had to drop your pen and say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Get up from your cubicle and go around the corner and then have that conversation with them. Think how that applies to our crew members who are also speaking to our international partners on the International Space Station. So to that, uh, Chris, that's, that's why we're doing this. I'll give you a chance to tell us how we measure things. Okay. Thank you, Dick. Good to talk to you all today. Okay, uh, some other things I wanted to mention um, are some of the current activities that we have going on on board. Uh, right now we have a lot of um, um, concentration and interest on our, our payload research. I think it's uh, very important. It's why we have the International Space Station there. Uh, and, uh, um, but to connect it with acoustics, uh, we have a lot of um, uh, work going on with predicting the noise of all the new payloads that we're introducing and making sure that the noise contributed by those payloads are, um, meet our acoustic requirements and do not contribute to the factors that uh, Dr. Danielson just discussed. Uh, we have also have, uh, for example, the beam, which is uh, newly uh, attached and, um, and uh, also pose some interesting acoustics um, um, aspects, including uh, the inflation of the beam and uh, how we were going to handle the, the noise of the, of the air rushing out uh, while the crew were inside, uh, possibly uh, inflating the beam. Also, uh, we had to do, use some acoustic modeling to um, predict noise levels inside beam. Uh, other things that are going on uh, are, uh, for example, uh, we're trying to reduce the carbon dioxide uh, used by the crew. Uh, to do this, we need to increase AAA, which are the fans that are, uh, are the CCAA common cabin air assembly fans, which are circulating air throughout all the modules. So we have to uh, concentrate on that. We have uh, now setting up for dual visiting vehicles, where we've had uh, ventilation changes on the ISS, and, and more uh, uh, CCAA fan speed increases are foreseen for that. So that also has an acoustics aspect aspect and uh, and then also we're looking at this uh, adding an additional uh, US crew member um, so this also we're looking for a place for them to sleep uh, which uh, we need to know what the noise levels are and uh, possibly developing a new uh, sleep station so all of that includes acoustic aspects uh, and of course we have the commercial crew program going on uh, which we're uh, looking at for uh, noise in terms of the launch noise that it produces and also the on-orbit noise and then also we have the Orion MPCV. So we have a lot going on uh, in acoustics. All right, so um, regarding the metrics, uh, just a few things that Dick talked about uh, and trying to relate them in the things that we measure uh, to get metrics to be able to control the noise and set requirements. So for uh, hearing loss and, uh, and noise that is affecting the human, we use the A-weighted uh, sound level. So that's the DBA and the A on the back uh, means sound level and I'll show you a plot uh, in the next slide that will make that easier. We use that to measure um, hazardous noise levels uh, that may uh, damage hearing uh, and also we use it to measure the LEQs which are, uh, which are the noise exposure levels which is noise over time and how much exposure during the day uh, or while the crew sleeps that they are exposed to. Uh, the next uh, metric we use is a speech interference level. Uh, we call it SIL4, and the 4 means that we use four octave bands, and I'll show you that also in my next slide. But it's basically the noise, um, the noise in the frequency range where the speech is located and how high that level is uh, compared to what is needed for a person to generate from their vocal energy to overcome that noise, and that's called the speech interference level. Uh, for habitability, including crew rest, productivity, reduced stress, we use noise criterion curves. Uh, and based on uh, NC50, for example, is a conservative uh, for hearing conservation and for communications. We also use signal-to-noise ratio, uh, so we make sure that we have, a sign uh, so we have uh, enough alarm uh, audibility so that you can hear alarms uh, right away and you know that, the, that there's an alarm going on and you can respond to that emergency. Also, we have requirements to, uh, for crew annoyance. Uh, we look at narrowband versus broadband content. Uh, and then we also limit intermittent and impulse noises during sleep. There are different environments uh, that we uh, need to control these different types of noise for. And uh, for example, launch and abort uh, are some of the highest levels that we see. 
and so we have a certain set of requirements for that. And then we have a, a requirements for on-orbit uh, acoustics, which we're uh, primarily working to uh, control levels so that we can communicate and maintain habitability and do crew sleep. Okay, so here are how our um, noise levels, and I think I'll walk over here so I can point to them. So this here is our noise, uh, noise criterion, the, our NC family of curves, and our requirements are typically based on this NC50 for, uh, for the vehicle. Uh, when we include payloads in that, then we actually have a little bit higher. We use this, an NC52, which is a little bit higher. But you can see that it's a sound pressure level as a function of an octave frequency band. And so uh, that's what our requirements are based on. Uh, so if you were to calculate an A-weighted level, uh, it's A-weighted. That's the metric that we use to um, compare for uh, crew-related effects like hearing loss. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, using these A-weighted levels. And the A-weighting means that the frequency response of the human is applied to these curves so that the lower frequencies are attenuated. Uh, and then at 1 kilohertz, there's no attenuation. And then you add up all of the uh, energy and all the frequency bands, and that, and that gives you your A-weighted overall sound pressure level, which is here. Uh, so for an NC50 value, your uh, A-weighted sound level is 58. And then if you were to average the four bands, 500 through 4 kilohertz, and average that, then you would get this speech interference level, and for 50 is 51. And you'll notice that the speech interference levels pretty much line up with the noise criterion number. So if for 50, we got 51. For 60, we get 60. For 70, we get 70. And that's the way that the noise criterion curves were set up were to agree with the speech interference levels. Um, and now, uh, how the speech interference level relates, uh, you can see this is here from ANSI standard. Um, and you can see that in terms of the distance between the talker and the listener, um, you have a speech interference level here, and it tells you, for example, with a speech interference level of 50, or, then you, at a distance of, of 2 meters, uh, you can speak in a normal voice. So you see normal, raised, very loud, or shout, different vocal efforts. And then this uh, gray area is here is, uh, is an effect uh, where when, the, when you're in the presence of a loud sound, uh, you tend to talk louder. Sure, next slide. Okay, and this uh, shows the thermometer. Actually, I need to look at the screen. So, um, and uh, so you can see that uh, where we are in ISS is right around 60 dBA. Uh, typical vacuum cleaners, 70 dBA. Uh, you know, and like a rock concert's 110. Of course, you wouldn't uh, want to have an environment that high. We like to keep our sleep stations around 50 dBA. Okay, things that make noise on ISS include hardware. Um, we have treadmills and fans and air conditioning equipment. Also, reverberation is important. Um, so the task is to control all the noise from this various hardware, uh, and not just on an individual basis, but also in a, as an integrated uh, whole inside a, a module or a, a habitat. Um, so we have uh, things that we do to control this noise. Uh, and so here's a list of that. Uh, starts out with a good set of requirements and verification requirements. Uh, and then we take these uh, requirements and we allocate them uh, down to each of the individual noise sources and try and control the different noise sources. We have hardware design reviews where we, we look at all these things. And, uh, and on complicated equipment, it's recommended that an acoustic noise control plan be developed, which uh, includes uh, writing down how you're going to choose your noise sources, choose the quietest noise sources, what type of acoustic analysis you're going to perform, how you're going to sub-allocate to your components and give each of your components its own requirement. What are you going to do for each component to control that noise? So you have a noise control design for each component. You need to perform early acoustic testing so you know what your levels are starting out with. And then um, you do component noise control testing to make sure your noise controls are working. And it also describes your schedule and your recovery plans if, if, uh, if you're not as quiet as you need to be. All of our verifications are done by test or test, test including some analysis, but it's mostly based on test. Um, and then we do a system level analysis 
uh, rolling up uh, all the sources. And then if we need to take remedial actions, we can do that after the fact to do further noise control. And then we have a certification of flight readiness process. And then we follow it up with on-orbit acoustic monitoring so that we know that our levels are where they need to be. So um, this just shows um, in acoustics, you always, uh, there's three things that you need to worry about. The noise source itself, how it's transmitted to the cabin or the volume, and that's the, the noise path, the path that it takes. You can either have the airborne path or a structure-borne path. Um, and then you have the receivers who are hearing the noise. And so when you do noise control, you always attack the noise source first. It's always easier. You use less, uh, less materials to attack a noise source at the source. Uh, your second choice is to attack the path, so you can, um, you can damp out the transmission or uh, put stuff in the way of the, of the transmission. And then as a last resort, you control the noise at the receiver. So, um, and then the other thing that ties it all together that uh, is, is really developing and a lot of technology is going into this now, it's, it's really nice, and that is acoustic modeling. Uh, there are really uh, some techniques that have, have uh, really improved a lot. Statistical energy analysis is the one that we use primarily uh, in the higher frequencies, and then you uh, have to use a different method in lower frequencies, finite element method or boundary element method. Ray noise is also a, a, a type of acoustic modeling that we used to use now that we've transitioned over the statistical energy analysis combined with the, the finite element method. And what's really made these uh, improve is the uh, amount of geometry that you can now put into the calculation. So uh, that's really worked nice. And then, um, so some of the important things here is to control the noise source with the quiet fan design or quiet fan selection. You have active noise control of fans. Um, and then you use a sound power measurement. So sound pressure level is what you hear at your ear. And it's a function of how far away you are from the noise source. It's also a function of your environment and how reverberant space that you're, that you're in. However, sound power is just a function of the source. Uh, you measure it uh, in an anechoic chamber so you don't get reflections back in. And you measure just the noise coming away from the source. And it's not a function of the distance. Uh, it's just a measure of how much power the whole noise source is putting out. And that's uh, what we use as our input to our acoustic modeling. Um, <coughs> Uh, especially with statistical energy analysis, sound power measurement gives you the energy, so it's, it works out very nicely. Uh, then we look at acoustic materials development, and that feeds into our acoustic modeling. Uh, we look at system level <coughs> noise controls, so what can we do in the, in the, in the room, put blankets on the walls uh, to, to provide as much um, attenuation of, of we, as we can of the reverberation environment. And then we look at component level noise controls, mufflers and, um, and sound blocking that we do put on, on the noise source. Um, and then after all of that, we can predict what the sound pressure level, that's what your ear hears, uh, at the receiver. So uh, we do testing and verification of this. Uh, and then we go back and, and make changes if we need to. Um, of course, on orbit, we do acoustic monitoring. Uh, emission operations, we have flight rules. If things get too loud, we need to know when to have to hear your hearing protection. That's what Jose is going to talk about. Um, and then um, we have anomaly resolution, uh, where if we need to uh, add some treatments on orbit, we can do that. We have hearing protection that we, that we use if we need to according to the flight rules. And then we're working on some advanced <coughs> acoustic monitoring techniques uh, so we can monitor uh, easier without uh, as much crew time. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of a development that, that we helped uh, with, and that was developing a new Russian quiet fan, or a, a quieter fan for the Russian segment. Uh, this fan uh, turns out that uh, uh, they had old uh, mirror uh, technology uh, in their fans in the service module, and the blades on the fans uh, were just flat plates uh, that were cambered. and. Uh, and ran at a fairly high RPM, so we did a development. Um, the service module has over 40 fans in it, and so it's, it's, uh, it was loud. Uh, and so developed this new fan and achieved um, 12 dBA of noise reduction. Uh, however, in the aer aerodynamically, the, uh, the amount of air put out was almost double, I'd say maybe um, almost twice as much air in terms of CFM output 
while reducing the noise level. So that was a very good achievement. I'll show, you, I'll show you some information on that later. We also have a quiet fan selection tool where these fans weren't really designed to be quiet, but we've uh, measured about 100 different fans. Um, about half of them are shown here. Uh, and then we've put them in a, a database that you can go in and you can put in what your pressure rise and your flow rate needs to be. I think we have an automatic advance there. And then, uh, so that would be your design point. And then we have the, uh, the, um, the design uh, performance curves that are, that are measured, along with the sound power levels that were also measured. So you can see for this design point what the sound power level was. You can choose which voltage you want to operate at, and you can choose different fans and compare them and compare their noise levels. So if you're a hardware developer, like a payload developer, you can uh, come and use the quiet fan selection tool, tool and uh, pick the fan that is best for your device. Uh, this is just an illustration of a sound power level measurement. I wanted to show it to you because to measure what you hear, the sound pressure level, you just use a single microphone and you just put it in space, like a handheld sound level meter. If you want to measure sound power, one of the techniques is to use an intensity probe, which is actually two microphones, and it measures the acoustic intensity, which is the sound power per unit area. And the two microphones, uh, you basically, it's basically a discretization um, between the two microphones to get an acoustic velocity, and then acoustic velocity times, uh, uh, times uh, acoustic pressure, that is your acoustic intensity. And then you take your intensity probe and you put it at each of the centers of each of those squares and you do an average and then you can map out the sound power level and you can see the map of it there in the corner. So that's what we use as our input to our acoustic models. We also do acoustic flight materials development. Uh, this uh, shows Holly and Reynolds and Ephraim here uh, uh, using the impedance tubes. Uh, these impedance tubes submit a plane wave of energy and you put a, a test sample down at the back and um, measure how much noise is reflected off of it and then you, could, um, you get the sound absorption and you also get all the characteristic impedances and these also feed into our acoustic modeling so we can put sound absorption on different parts of our acoustic model uh, and predict what effect that's going to have. You could also do transmission loss in this tube where, uh, you, uh, again, you put the plane wave in and you get not only the sound reflected back, but you also get the sound that goes through the material so you get a transmission loss. Uh, that's what this facility is. It's also a transmission loss facility. And we've used that and that also you, uh, will input into the acoustic modeling. Uh, we use this device here to help develop our crew quarters on ISS. Okay, here's this shows our modeling. So you can see that um, uh, along with our acoustic model, so here's the model up here in the top right. These are the air spaces in the model, the acoustic where the acoustic waves propagate. Uh, here you can see all the, the wall panels. And then this shows our ECLIS wall. So this is a model of our Orion spacecraft. Uh, and the, all of our noise producing hardware from our ECLIS, which is environmental control and life support, are behind this wall. And so we need to make sure that we're able to model the transmission through the wall accurately. And to do that, we have actually an acoustic mock-up in our lab, which is here. It's actually a physical mock-up. And uh, we use this to validate our acoustic models. So for in our mock-up, so for example, we have a sound power. This is a calibrated known sound power source. So we can put that in there, we can put it behind the ECLIS wall, and then we can uh, do a measurement and predict what the sound pressure level is going to be in the reverberant environment. And so that's how we validate uh, the models. And so, um, you know, our mock-up has the same surface area, internal surface area and volume as the uh, real Orion vehicle, and those are the two important acoustic parameters for that. This shows a validation of our system level noise controls where we wanted to make sure we were able to predict uh, the amount of absorption from these uh, thinsulate uh, on the reverberation environment, and we were able to do that. Also, we looked at sealing around the, um, the ECLIS wall to make sure that we were able to keep all the acoustical noise inside, um, inside behind the wall there. So that's an example of our system level noise controls, and then here's an example of our component level noise controls. So this shows an ISS fan, this is an ISS IMV fan. And you can see it's connected upstream and downstream of these silencers, which are just basically big mufflers. And so that's an example of a component noise control. So both the component and system noise controls are very important to controlling noise. 
Here's some other noise controls that we've done on various things. Uh, this is in the back of the Melfi minus 80 degree freezer that we had to do some pipe lagging to control that. Uh, this is some duct treatment that we put in the US Russian segment to control noise on some of the fans. Um, this is a development of our early sleep station, the TESS, uh, and these walls are made to block out the noise. And this is also on the Melfi. It's, uh, it's acoustic treatment that we use to cover, to contain, and absorb the noise from the it uh, uses a Brayton machine to cool, uh, cool the air in there. This shows uh, some of our acoustic testing. Um, we have acoustic requirements for all of the hardware that we put on ISS, and so uh, the noise producing hardware uh, that needs to meet those requirements, we do acoustic testing. We don't do it all ourselves. Uh, the, the developer is welcome to do the acoustic testing, but we also provide the service. So there's so some interesting uh, ones here. So Robonaut was a fun test because we got it to move through with all its uh, uh, motions. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, also, the rings here look sort of like a spacecraft taken off. We hung it in our new anechoic chamber there. Uh, the crew quarters was a very important development. And here's that Melfi I was telling you about with the Brayton machine up here and all the pipe lagging in the back of the rack. We also do all of our uh, verifications by, by testing, and then this just shows uh, the verification test that we did in our US lab vehicle before it was launched. It's uh, Sam Denham, an old acoustic compadre, uh, in here with all these microphones, um, making sure that uh, the US lab met its acoustic requirement. We have different measurement techniques that we use. Um, so uh, reverberation time is a measure. Uh, we fill the, fill the room with noise, and then we turn it off and measure how long it takes to decay. Uh, so that's a way to measure the reverberation uh, of a space. Um, sound intensity, I discussed earlier, where you measure that. And from the sound intensity, you integrate that over the surface, you get sound power. There's also other methods uh, that we use to measure sound power. We have a, a dome of microphones that we can use in our anechoic chamber to measure sound power more quickly. It takes a long time to set up, but then each test goes quickly. Um, of course, we measure acoustic absorption with our impedance tubes and the transmission loss as well. Um, and insertion loss we do just by testing um, of, of physical mock-ups. Transmission loss is, um, is sort of an ideal transmission over infinite pieces of material, where an insertion loss is what an actual structure does to reduce noise. You just measure it with and without the structure. We also use our uh, lab to do demonstrations. For example, what is NC50? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, you know, it's hard to understand unless you actually go experience the environment. So uh, for our management, we set up demonstrations of NC50 uh, or NC60 or some other requirement, or we do demonstrations of what the actual noise is like uh, so we can give demonstrations. All right. Um, This one also talks about our uh, lab facilities. We have um, we have a, a new an, uh, an anechoic chamber in our uh, in our lab. We also have a small quiet room. <coughs> we also have mobile equipment. We can take uh, this is a photo here of doing an acoustic test in the ATV, which is a auto, uh, European automated transfer vehicle that we did over in Germany. So we took our equipment, and uh, this is a picture of me uh, at Kennedy Space Center where we built this great big huge. Um, anechoic room uh, to measure the Melfi. So here's the Melfi inside that, that big room we used. Uh, high density foam on the outside over scaffolding and hung some thinslet on the inside. This is our small quiet room in our lab. And that's Linda Hess there. Okay, we also do on-orbit um, monitoring. Uh, this shows our current sound level meter and it measures sound pressure levels in all of the different octave bands. Uh, measurement time is about 20 seconds, and we use it to characterize our continuous noise. Uh, this shows a cosmonaut here uh, making uh, the measurement. And then you can see our report there uh, <coughs> that comes out. This shows the different levels uh, that we've measured, uh, pretty much typical levels. These were measured in, in 2015. Um, and so this uh, is a table of those metrics that I started out with. So we have NC level here and then the speech interference level, 
and then the A-weighted noise level, and then the sound level meter survey date. And these are arranged from the quietest module at the top to the loudest module at the bottom, so you can see that the airlock and the, and the gym logistics module are very quiet, permanent uh, uh, multipurpose module. And then our quietest laboratory module right now is the, is the gym. Um, it also shows that uh, the levels vary. For example, uh, node two, um, oh, okay, well, bef okay. Node two is uh, NC59 and 50 dBA, or 50 speech interference level and 61 uh, dBA, and that is higher than it usually is. It's usually up, up, up here, much quieter, and that's because of some stalled IMV fans, which when they stall, they make, a loud, they make loud noise until we clean them, and, and then, uh, then the noise level goes back down. So that's an example here. Uh, I wanted to point out that um, nominally all of our modules are uh, below NC52, so uh, there's the break where NC52 is. So all of the U.S. modules are usually meeting requirements except for Node 3, which uh, doesn't meet requirements. Uh, it has some noisy hardware in it. I um, also wanted to show that the docking compartment, uh, which used to be the loudest module on the space station, uh, had three quiet fans, replaced their fans, and now it is the quietest Russian module. So it's moved a lot. And you can see it's had a noise reduction from 67 down to 59 dBA because of all the fan installations. You can see here the quiet fan installations that we did on DC-1, the MRM-1, MRM-2, <coughs> and the service modules. So the Russians are really hard at work replacing their loud fans with the, with the quieter ones. Here this shows the sleep station levels for the crew quarters and the two Russian, uh, <coughs> Russian sleep stations, which they call Cayudas. And uh, we're trying for a 50 dBA. So you can see typically we're under 50 uh, dBA uh, that's needed to provide uh, restful sleep. These Russian ones, these levels are a little high. I've seen them as low as 52, uh, 52 and 51, uh, but they tend to fluctuate. This is an example of that stalled IMV fan. Um, you can see dust builds up on the inlet screen and it, and it stalls the fan. The fan is still moving, but the air is just recirculating within the fan and it makes a loud noise until that dust is removed. But the problem with that is you have to take the fan out sometimes to do that or disconnect the duct work. All right, we also have uh, dosimetry measurements. And I'm just going to show this uh, slide here. I'm not going to talk much about it because Jose is going to spend a lot of time talking about dosimetry measurements. Uh, and then uh, we're trying to uh, develop some new hardware uh, for flight. And this is a unit that uh, we call it our combo SLMAD, or now we're calling it our combo acoustic monitor. And uh, this little device performs the function of both the, the decimeter and the sound level meter in one unit. So we're hoping to go to that in the near future. Uh, this is a noise hazard level indicator, and Jose's going to talk a little bit more about that, too. All right, so uh, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Danielson. He's going to talk about strategies for protecting uh, Preventing hearing loss. Thank you. I'll borrow that microphone back. Oh. Denise, I got the feeling that you really wanted to help us with this mic with this computer. I'll give you that opportunity because if you move the slides, you'll keep me from going too long. How about that? Good thinking, huh? So <clears throat> I'll stand over here. How's that? Reese, okay. So <clears throat> in as much as Chris is uh, am excited about his noise measurements and fan noise. Uh, I'd like to spin it to say this, so what? How does this affect our crew? So what? <laughs> <laughs> Someone here has thought that. Maybe he was sitting over here. But let me describe it because, in fact, our intent then is to talk about how this might be impacting on crew. Next slide, Denise. Next. So I showed you this list initially, and I'm going to diminish in this talk uh, our attention to this, but absolutely, actually, it's just the opposite. Our primary reason for doing all the noise measurements that Chris and Jose are going to describe today are about habitability, communication, disruption of sleep, alertness and awareness of audible sounds, including our caution and warning signals. That's actually the primary focus. Uh, fortunately, the issue of, develop of risk of hearing loss is present, but it's not our primary reason. In fact, it's not unusual for the crew to come back 
and say, you know, for the first two months, I didn't think the noise was all that much. But I started to get on my nerves, so I started to wear the hearing protection that we provide to prevent hearing loss, mostly just to diminish their awareness. Have you ever traveled in an aircraft and worn earplugs to diminish the noise of the noisy baby behind you? The baby's crying wasn't causing hearing loss, but it was disturbing your sleep, perhaps, or making you less aware of when you're camping out, someone to the other side of the campground was making noise. So let's talk then in this next development about uh, issues related to hearing loss. Next slide. What can we do to mitigate some of the risks of noise? Um, there are, in fact, issues that Chris has already described. Blanketing, um, modifications, new fans that are related to re requirements and noise control plans and verifications that perhaps are the reason that you're here today. <laughs> Maybe you're involved in that. Maybe you're involved in hardware design or procurement of these. Um, these two fellows up here are definitely involved in on-orbit monitoring so that if something is excessively high, in fact, sometimes we're questioned, why do we have to do those noise measurements? We've done it many times over because when we see something spike, it can be associated then with a squeaky tevis or a fan that, can be a, that is going out of round. So these are basically doing forensics on engineering issues related to the ISS. <clears throat> Uh, in my role then is to contribute for the flight surgeon's information about the audiometric test data, the monitoring that's going on, either on ground or on orbit. I'll describe that now. And then we also have flight rules that guides the crew as times when they should be wearing hearing protection or even the activity is such that we build it into the flight rule to say when you're doing this on the treadmill and you're exceeding 10 miles per hour, we require hearing protection. You're or we're requiring the flight surgeon, the BMEs, to alert them to say, that's a time to wear hearing protection because it exceeds a certain level. Next slide. Here's the tricky part. My colleagues who are engineers want to know how much noise is too much noise. But uh, our crew is very different than the instruments or the robots that are on orbit. That is, for some of you, um, the sound of a band playing in the garage, you're a teenager, you know where he is. Happy sound, he's home. But to the neighbor who's on the other side, that might be an aversive signal at 11 or 10 o'clock at night. Uh, if, I, if this is an old fashioned blackboard and I was running my fingernails down along the blackboard, acoustically, the machine might not say that it's got characteristics that are really hazardous or particularly high, but it could drive us wonky to listen to that scratchy, aversive kind of a signal. So the human response is such that it's not uniform among all people. Uh, some people enjoy country music and some people enjoy classical music and the two may not mix very well depending on the individual's mood. So consequently, this habitability issue is a tricky one for us to predict in community noise or in environmental noise as to how much noise is too much noise. So we base our criteria on a generalization. And in terms of uh, hearing loss, We've identified that people who are exposed to the same noise, if all of us were working in the same plant and watching the pop bottles go down this line here, none of us would develop exactly the same degree of hearing loss due to characteristics of our own physics and our own genes. Uh, in fact, uh, this is pointing out a classic study that uh, in, a, in a major industry, they found that individuals who've been standing there doing their jobs all together there's as much as a 50 to 70 dB difference in terms of their subsequent hearing loss at the end of their 40 year career. So how much noise is too much noise? It depends. And so what we've built are noise damage risk criteria that depends, that as I'll describe, talks about how much noise and how long you're exposed to that noise is called the noise exposure and therein lies our flight rule. Next slide. Uh, this reminds uh, me to tell you that this business about monitoring hearing among crew members is a lifelong process now, and, and that's earnestly what I'm involved with at the clinic. Uh, we'll, we are identifying next spring, we'll be seeing in ASCAN physicals, we'll identify what these pilots and these um, active as, uh, candidates have in terms of their pre-flight hearing status. We're monitoring during their two years of ASCAN training monitor it during their career, be it a 10-year or a 30-year career at NASA. And subsequently, we also are seeing the crew members when they return for their long-term uh, lifetime surveillance of astronaut health, the LSAH program that some of you are, are aware of, but in fact, they're, they're back. I'm seeing 
uh, Apollo era astronauts for annual physicals when they return back as we're monitoring them. Next slide. Hearing assessments are done in my clinic in two different ways. The conventional way. Perhaps even you as uh, civil servants have had sat in one of the booths and had air conduction audiometry with conventional earphones. It's a test of peripheral hearing sensitivity. It's the beep test. Push the button when you hear the tone. Uh, we monitor it among our crew members as well to do their baseline tests. So once those astronaut candidates have been identified and they report in, in fact, this last class was great. I saw them the afternoon of their ceremony out at Ellington. They took their blazers off, took their ties off, and I had a chance to give you their baseline hearing test and give them the willies about the importance of protecting the hearing that they had left. That's their baseline for their career. They do annual hearing tests during their physical exams. Um, they'll do retests if needed, and they continue to cycle back. If there's a change, for instance, if they show a shift that is an early flag, not a hearing loss, we'll define that in a minute, but if there's something to say, what, what are you doing? And Janice would say, well, it wasn't that much. I just went, I, I had a great time at a concert this weekend. Or I'm building something in my cabin. And I'm working weekends with a chainsaw and carpentry equipment. And it's not a big hearing loss yet, but it's shown a shift that's outside of the norm. That's an early flag where we can then counsel Janice to change her behavior's attitude about protecting her residual hearing. And I hope that that's a message for you as well. I get credit for a hearing conservation lecture today if I change your behaviors. On the other hand, the crew cannot do, do this with conventional earphones with that mass. They cannot take that relatively heavy piece of equipment and that very heavy audiologist and that very heavy booth with them on orbit to perform the same tests. So we've modified that. Our, our instruments are modified so that they have uh, some custom fit. Basically, these are ear monitors that you see the rock performers wear as they dance around in the diamond vision. So it's got an excellent frequency response. They pr use that for their sound delivery system that's presented from the sound card on the space station computer. They manipulate it and they perform a test that we call the on-orbit hearing assessment, or UHA. The Russians love it because their ger the Russian word for ear is UHA. So they think that's pretty humorous. Uh, to Rather than have a heavy isolation, we urge them to go to the quietest location that they can find. Now it's lucky enough to have the crew quarters, turn the fans down, and then they dump on some Bose uh, Quiet Comfort 2 active noise reduction headsets. All of these have other purposes. Uh, obviously, they, they use the space station for computer for something else besides doing a hearing test. Um, they also use this for, mon for using uh, as to isolate the noise from their activities on the treadmill and they listen to music and books and movies because it isolates an excellent frequency response. And then the Bose headsets are actually, uh, they have a role for the, uh, the ground to a station um, I, um, um, conferences, uh, the IP phones for telecons conferences with their families, put a mic on it and they, they uh, prefer to use that. Next slide. So this is the time sequence as it's currently outlined by the medical requirement 1.8 for hearing assessments. A, a pre-flight audiometric test is done by us in the clinic. Uh, so this is conventional pure tone audiometry. And then post-flight. I'll be doing uh, uh, Tim Copra's next Monday uh, uh, after he in the process of his post-flight tests. That actually is going to stretch out to be actually about R plus something, but it's contingent upon some changes that we have. If there is a change, we'll repeat it, and then he gets in the link and we do annual audiometry. In UHAs, uh, this is involved with training that's done by our Wiley, Wiley uh, Education Office uh, for EHS. They perform a baseline test in the clinic with sound that mimics the environment in which they'll be doing their testing. So if there's fan noise in the crew quarters, we dump in an equivalent amount of sound levels that mimic that environment. They, they use their custom-made earpieces which may have short canals or long canals, so that is then controlled. And they perform this test using the space station computer in my booth. Because that test is unusual, it's done with unusual non-calibrated earphones and, non, and not ANSI standard earphones, they are immediately done going through a conventional audiometric test. So I can compare an ANSI hearing test done by pure tone audiometry with this unconventional UHA as their baseline. After launch, they do one um, currently at around L plus 14. After things are settled down, they've already done their 
safety checks and they can fit into the more mundane things of, of medical requirements. And then they perform a series of in-flight tests who has sequentially during the, ex during the flight. Currently, they're doing it at L every 45 days thereafter the first one. So we compare it sequentially and they share that data with the uh, JAXA crew surgeons, Canadians, and of course our Russian partners. Uh, and uh, who did I miss? Uh, ESA, of course. So that's good. You're moving me along just like I needed to have you do. Thank you. So what is, so let's describe a, a hearing test. And it's important to understand this because you've had a hearing test and say, man, I've done it and I can't hear myself breathe. I'm not sure if I heard it. I pushed the button. I didn't. So let me explain how this process works. Our ear is not equivalently sensitive to all frequencies from low to high frequencies. We can potentially hear as low as 20 hertz or as high as 20,000 hertz. But in the end, we're not very sensitive to low frequency sounds. So can, um, a number of years ago, decades ago, uh, they backpacked some equipment into a remote area called Wisconsin <laughs> and did it at a state fair. And they asked the individuals to say, put on these earphones, I'm going to turn, per, conduct a sound test, listen for the tone, you tell me when you hear it. And Janice would say, I can't hear it. No, 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 no. And Janice said, I heard it at this, at this frequency there. Next slide. Just tap it. Um, somebody else said, I heard it, and that maybe a few decibels difference. So we built a bell curve of thousands of young, healthy ears to develop then this standard to say, you know what, the range typically at this frequency, uh, there's a range of about uh, seven or eight decibels from within that one standard deviation of hearing sensitivity in young, healthy ears with no ear disease. Do it once more. At another frequency, we're more sensitive once more. So eventually then we connect these we can connect these ranges to say, rather than normal hearing at this frequency is 45, and at this one is 31, and this one is 17 and 10. Um, conventionally, audiologists are not good mathematicians, so we just draw a line through all these connect, connect the dots. And we convert this to another kind of a decibel, because Chris told us about some decibels today, the decibel with the A-weighted scale, the SILs. Uh, a decibel, you have to know what kind of a decibel you were talking about because there are a numerous ones. And this one is on the sound pressure level, but it turns into a hearing level scale. So that threshold, this line will reveal for you, as you see, we're most sensitive in the mid frequencies. It's a good idea because that's where we talk. We don't need to hear rumble sounds. We don't need to hear high squeaky sounds. This is important for us in this region because that's the region where my sound spectrum are right now. Secondly, uh, audiometric test then is not an absolute measurement. It's not as if I would just say, here's the edge of the table that's measured. And in terms of where's the threshold, uh, somewhere in here, plus or minus a few decibels. So let's look at the next slide and talk about how this, this hearing sensitivity works. So this is an audiogram now where we have converted this red line, hit it once more, Janice, please, to a red line that's up here. This is now in the hearing level scale, you see that? So that zero dB doesn't mean there's no sound because this doesn't mean that there's no sound. It means that it's built on the human psychometric scale of how we hear. Some people can hear pretty well. And let me tell you, when they're applying for an astronaut candidate position, they listen very, very carefully. What that means is that they potentially can get a minus five three dB threshold because there is sound below this red line down here. There's sound pressure there. The microphone that on the sound level meter would say that there's sound there. But most people didn't hear it there, so we said, you know, let's draw a line through the middle, and that's the middle, and so some people can hear minus 5 dB thresholds once in a while, even as they stay in the astronaut core. I've got some, some candidates, I, or some astronauts, I tease them to say, I need you in to come in and calibrate my equipment on Monday after you retire, so I can prove that my equipment still works. On the other hand, sadly enough, not everyone maintains excellent hearing of of uh, their youth. Some have a misspent youth. And some of you may have a, had a misspent youth. If that is the case, you might develop a pattern like that. Uh, in the second row, I'm proud to show you my uh, interns who are here working with me on projects. And they would look at that and they would sort of immediately say, that's characteristic of a noise-related hearing loss. And they're absolutely right. That's the kind of pattern that we expect to see for someone who's been exposed to loud noise for a sustained period of time without adequate hearing protection. Too many concerts, too many times in the firing range, um, too much time on a rig. And so that's the pattern that we see. And to make it quick and, and simple, that region is occurring because we have a boost of sound in our ear canal that amplifies high frequency sounds. 
So even though the machine may be equivalent producing 100 dB all the way across, it's boosted in the high frequencies because of the ear canal that we have. This does a little bit more. If it had a long pipe, it actually boosts some more sounds, right? So the ear canal is built to help us to hear high frequency sounds. And then we have a little muscle in our ear that contracts when we hear loud sounds and it reduces our awareness of low frequency sounds. So that's the pattern we expect to see from noise exposure. Um, that's good. All right, no, this is, and you're doing right. Now, how does that impact what we hear? This then is another audiogram from low to high frequencies that are being tested. And this region, all those dots, are the represent, they're representative of the region of sounds that are important for understanding speech. In this region, if we analyze my voice, and I did a, a vowel, ah, or ba, or ga, excuse me, or hard consonants, ga, er, I, E, O, U, most of the energy would be in the low frequencies. But if you analyzed acoustically, sounds like th and s and sh, you notice it's not very loud, it didn't travel very far. I cannot make that th sound louder because it's voiceless. And that information is primarily up here in the high frequencies, which is important for speech understanding or clarity. If I talk louder and louder, I can make words like gun and rim and mad my louder, but I can't make leaf, leap, least, leech. I can't make the voiceless sounds louder. So consequently, let's see if we tap that one more time. Sure, what happens is that the progressive pattern of a noise-related hearing loss over a crew member or a marine or a, a, someone who works in noisy stuff, an engineer from NASA who's building noisy projects at home, this is a progressive pattern that we're looking for to monitor, identify early that someone has a hearing loss in the high frequencies before it stops there and flops over here. Because he'll deny, he'll say, I don't, I can't tell that my, my hearing's fine because I hear you louder. I, you're loud enough, but you know the last couple of years it got to be less clear. So you're bumbling. I can't tell the difference between 15 and 16 because he's lost the high frequency sounds that he once had when he was a teenager. So it's tricky to be able to identify that. Next slide. So that audibility index is what we're looking for. So what's a shift? And I'm, my intention today is to help emphasize the difference between hearing loss and hearing shifts, particularly a mission-associated hearing shift. Because if you ask me, do astronauts have hearing loss as a result of space flight? I'll tell you, I've got astronauts who have hearing loss before they went to space. You see? So what's a shift is what we're concerned about. And here's an example. Someone has a hearing loss. Uh, perhaps this uh, was a naval officer, or perhaps this was someone who already had a pre-existing hearing loss. Um, just generically, that individual is qualified to pass an ASCAN physical. What we don't want to do is to have him progress or her progress to the path that we just saw a minute ago, walking down and making their speech understanding more complicated. So does this individual have a hearing loss? The way that OSHA, NASA, and the Department of Defense monitor this is to use the front end of the, that curve that went down this way and looking at two, three, and 4,000 hertz because those are the early flags. Not a problem, getting to be a problem, boy, it'll be a problem if this proceeds. So we track two and three and four. So that's the, that's the metric that's commonly used in occupational hearing conservation programs and that's what we apply in the flight medicine program. Let's look at that next. So for instance, the definition of a hearing threshold shift is a change from the baseline data. In our case, that baseline test that's done in the clinic. And seeing whether there's a shift of 10 decibels or no more at 2, 3, and 4,000 hertz. That's that early flag for noise-related hearing loss. We call it a mission-associated threshold shift if, in fact, the pre-flight and the post-flight show the shift. Meanwhile, frankly, I'm also tracking this on his pre-flight or his, pre his uh, baseline test in a conventional audiometric program as well. But the real question of whether the acoustics conditions that we're concerned about, is that impacting on their hearing? What I have to dig in and use with my international partners, let's be common and use a similar way of identifying a mission-associated shift between pre-flight and post-flight. 
and let's have one whale of a hearing conservation attitude between missions. You know what I mean? As they are partying and as they are doing their T-38 flights and they're doing their jobs and crafts at home, uh, we want to protect their hearing through their career, but right now we're talking about the effect of the mission itself. What is a hearing loss? Well, remember that cloud of sounds, all those dots? They're sort of in this region. So consequently, in conventionally, again, if I ask my interns what's normal hearing, they would say 25 dB or better would be normal hearing. And so consequently, this line across here is drawn intentionally at 25 dB. So a hearing loss would exceed, in this case, averaging these three frequencies if it's equal to or greater than 25 dB. Again, it's a common way of workers' compensation for OSHA to identify whether there's a hearing loss related to the job or not. There's a shift. Someone went from little, from great hearing to some hearing loss. That's cool. We want to identify that. But it's not a hearing loss until it starts to drop down between these three. Does this individual have a hearing loss? Da, 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 da. Yeah, it looks like uh, somewhere the average would be pretty close to 25 dB. So this individual would have a hearing loss. But we're tracking on here a baseline. And one, two, three in-flight tests, they're rock solid. There's no mission-associated shift. This individual had a hearing loss before the mission, did not have a hearing shift associated with the mission. On the other hand, looking at this one, we could potentially say for sure we're starting to see some drop-offs here that then did develop, and so we tagged this individual as having a UHA identified mission-associated hearing threshold shift during the mission. I'll point out a couple something else, though. Uh, in as much as this was rock solid in the low frequencies, we're seeing some changes here in the low frequencies. Next slide. Janice is going to show us uh, again, another example we use all the time. Uh, this was uh, one of our partners who had great hearing thresholds before the mission. And then in the second, first and second on-orbit test did show this characteristic notch. That's just like that graph I just showed you. We alerted the crew surgeon from the Russian Space Agency who's here in town. And they implemented more stringent or stronger recommendations to wear hearing protection shut the door uh, on the crew on the Coyuta back there in that noisy um, Russian segment and use hearing protection more consistently. And, con and to my pleasure, uh, it, it decreased the awareness of this or de demonstration of that shift. On the other hand, if you draw your attention to this, there's a, been a de an obvious decrement in the low frequencies of 250 and 500 hertz. In physics, if you change the stiffness of something, you tighten the guitar string, it no longer will play a, a, a G. It'll go sharp, right? You're trying to make it vibrate at a certain frequency, but it's going to go sharp because we're making it stiff. So consequently, this hints of one of three things that we've been concerned about. Now, this was a great indication. I missed him. One notch and it improved. But that low frequency business, um, for us in the clinic was really troubling. Was it due to one, ambient noise? Because it's hard to hear a low frequency sound in a noisy room. Well, we're doing it, the baseline was done in the same conditions, we think, as the in-flights. We mimicked it, they had hearing protection, they had Bose headsets. Secondly, is it due to some middle ear stiffness? Was there something that was stiffening the eardrum and the, and the mechanisms behind it? that keep it from, from vibrating well at low frequencies. If you've flown, you can't pop your ears. I'm all clogged up, pop your ear. Then you can hear the low frequencies again. Your hearing comes back. There's a decrease in the low frequencies. is, is improved where we don't have that stiffness in the middle ear. The other question could be if it is related to stiffness, and that's what's being examined right now uh, by the project that the interns are working on, and that is, could it be stiffness within the fluid in the inner ear, the cochlea, that is connected by a small canal to the intracranial fluids that have increased intracranial pressure during space flight? You're familiar with the VIP issues that we've been so concerned on. I'm sure you've had a lecture probably in the academy about VIP. So our speculation is now, to, we're trying to find some associated patterns that could potentially show some stiffness at that foot plate of that third little bone that's connected to a window that's laying against this fluid that maybe is increasing its pressure with intercochlear pressures. 
Next slide. And we have more examples like that then. So that's the do that we saw before. And here's another case. In fact, we're seeing this in about 40% of the in-flight UHAs. So it's not of small consequence and it's not rare. Next slide. So I was asked recently to offer a summary to say, all right, you know, we're spending a lot of time on these hearing tests. Uh, do we have to do them? So we offered this summary. Uh, answering their question, does a hearing loss occur? Uh, regarding crew health, based on the evidence, the instance of temporary mission associated hearing threshold shifts, remember what that definition is? 10 dB shift in the high frequencies, which is the one that's characteristic of noise associated hearing loss. It's demonst been demonstrated from increment one in about 8% of the UHAs that have been performed. Sometimes not necessarily the same, the same crew mem member could have had uh, more than one of these uh, elevations. However, there's no permanent hearing loss identified in audiometry, the post-flight audiometry after their landing. Again, that is a mission-associated shift which turned into a hearing loss. Follow me? Secondly, then, the, the program is seeking a way to reduce the crew time. Could we have, essentially, could we carve out some UAs and not perform them every 45 days? And Chris and I have been to a series of meetings and it, we're moving in that direction. If as long there's no um, increased risk in as much as we continue to monitor uh, with acoustic monitoring and with some techniques that uh, we're going to be proposing to them, basically better associating the noise measurement with the uh, uh, hearing test results. Next slide. Um, a few years ago, we published an article that, if, that looked at the effect of the influence of hearing loss as shown in among, uh, with sex and gender. So let's skip this one and uh, read the uh, second bullet, that the LSAH-derived data, those are from the crew members who, are, who have flown and may be 39 or they may be 79. They show a more rapid decline in, in the left ear, which is also not unusual among for instance, Texas shooters who are shooting from a right shoulder and have the noise blast on the left side. Within the general population, hearing declines more rapidly in men than in women. Um, it's fair to say due in part due to environmental and occupational activities within the general population. And within our population, we don't see any evidence of uh, hearing loss related to microgravity exposure, just as we showed. Let's look at the next slide and I'll explain how this worked. So there's a, a um, ANSI has a very large database that's acquired from lots of people. And they call their database B a non-industrial noise exposed population. They ask people like you, do you work in a noisy job? And you say, no, I don't. But you might be doing things off duty. So you're growing older and, as, and that's being monitored then from let's say age 30 to age 80 in the database. And we're averaging then hearing thresholds at two, three, and 4,000 hertz, the criteria we just applied. <coughs> and in that, uh, the, we're showing that in the dash lines are this general population. They're aging plus they do fun things off duty. They're not working in a factory. They're not necessarily Marines on active duty. They're doing normal stuff like you working at a desk and maybe going to a concert, maybe doing some shop work, maybe doing some trap shooting off duty. That pattern, as you see, this uh, blue line represents the median value of hearing loss trends, averaging two, three, and four, from ages 30 to, to 80. This green line, is, these are, the, we, sometimes we wink and call it the tough ears. That's uh, only 10% the, of the people in this population have hearing better than the green line in the NINEP population. And only 10% have hearing poorer than the red line in the general population. My Swedish colleagues uh, don't call it tough and tender, they call it glass and stone ears. But it's, uh, you see what we're talking about. So this is a median value. 50% of the people in the population have a hearing loss. Males better than, than this, poorer than this. These are the values for females in that nine up population. The dark lines then are from our LSAH population. And so given that, Let's concentrate instead on some of the trends that I see. 
First, the standard deviations are narrower among our astronaut population. And we basically track along from age 30, which frankly is pretty unusual to have anybody in the LSH program. Oh, well, I know, in the astronaut population, they sometimes they come in and are usually about 35 is when we start seeing them. There they are. They'll track along, and there is no difference between the median values among the astronauts and the, theme and the uh, general population until we start getting up into the 60, 70, 80 population. Individuals who were test pilots in the military before they stressed hearing conservation, or they did things in their jobs before we stressed hearing conservation. Those of you who are um, young like me and in your 60s, uh, you remember the time when someone finally said, you know, you really ought to wear hearing protection more consistently when you do this job. That's this population. Uh, in our female population, it's uh, great because not only is their standard deviation narrower, but overall um, our scientists, our flight surgeons, our, our attentive uh, um, females, are overall they're doing much better throughout all of the years uh, that we have. Next slide. This is a way that we report this in to an individual who takes a hearing test in the LSAH program. We basically lay their individual, this is left ear and right ear, over their over these values for the 9-up. We also compare it to the, not only the general population, but to the other astronauts to kind of get a kick out and say, am I doing better than these other guys? And it's type A folks. So this individual, it's actually kind of a happy story. We can say, you know, originally, your hearing was poorer than the general population until later on, and you started to, you basically leveled off and you didn't decline because you heard the recommendations from your flight surgeon. You, were offered hearing protection, you were encouraged to wear hearing protection, and you bought into the idea of protecting your hearing on duty and off duty. Next slide will show us some other examples of this. This fellow, for instance, is a classic example. His hearing is better than 90% of the population eventually. Um, this, in, this male basically is better than, but it's twirling off and it's showing the same sort of trends. So this is a counseling technique that we use in the clinic. In this case, it actually paid off because this individual was tracking along with the median values, and in one year, one year only, started to show a significant decrease, which was a clinical indication that urged us to say, we recommend, after this physical that you see an ear specialist, to identify the nature of this, because your ears are the same age. One ear went down, the other ear didn't. There's no reason to explain why one ear would change like that. Next slide. Now the issue of uh, hearing protective devices. This is our mitigation. And a quick uh, story here about hearing protection. On orbit, they have uh, uh, foam earplugs, as you've used before. And uh, someone back here my, has got some foam plugs to pass around. Uh, these are uh, available for whoever wishes to have them. This slide, teaching slide, is the best is the one that you wear. Which is the best? The one that you wear. Some folks uh, prefer this, and, and, and that's not unusual. We also have some custom musicians' earplugs that have a flat attenuation. I'm gonna pass it around this to you, Dr. Risen. Here's an example, there's one in the bag, but you can see how the crooked bend in that particular ear would make, it would make sense that they're having difficulty getting a good fit with a conventional foam earplug because it would bend wrong. These are the custom electronic ear monitors which provide their own hearing protection while they're listening to external music as well as the Bose sets. Next slide. Uh, there's a big plate here, uh, Rosella, that, that, that case. Can I borrow that from you for a minute? If you've worn an earplug, you know that the sounds sound kind of uh, muffled when you wear it. And it depends on how deeply you put the earplug in your ear. So I'm passing this around. This is going to display the attenuation that's provided depending on how deep you put an earplug in your ear. All four of these earplugs are the same earplug, depending, but it's showing a very different performance depending on how deeply you put it in. All four of these earplugs have a 29 dB noise reduction rating on the box. <laughs> but they, they didn't achieve it in real life. So we use this technique to verify how much hearing protection this custom plug that we built, how much it actually provides. So the individual basically does a test with no ear plug in, with an ear plug in, and that, and that difference, go back just a bit. And the difference then is, is identified um, and it gives us a personal attenuation rating. And it's really a big thing in occupational hearing conservation, but it fits nicely in our flight crew program as well. Next slide. Okay, now about the risk. How much noise is too much noise? I'm going to transition to Jose's talk because the risk is based on how loud it is and how long you're there. 
So the risk for a lawnmower for 85 dB for eight hours is really the same risk as uh, 15 or minutes or 30 minutes to a chainsaw. So consequently, the damage risk criteria is built on this, and there's an equal energy concept that we <coughs> apply. In terms of energy, if we increase the level by 3 dB, we have to cut the duration in half. Increase by 3, cut it in half. Cut the 3 dB half. So that's why we can, I can say 15 or 30 minutes to a chainsaw it would be equivalent to a lawnmower that has a screw-on muffler. Next slide. So our current noise control flight rule, noise constraints flight rule, uses these damage risk criteria that are similar to what's used by OSHA and NIOSH and the Department of Defense, but they're incredibly uh, fussy. They are very conservative. We are not interested in preventing hearing loss among some workers or most soldiers. We're trying to prevent hearing loss even among the folks with the tender ears. Remember those fellows? So consequently, our technique is to use criteria by splitting the noise risk during the workday, 16 hours. They're awake, they're moving around, they're doing activities. They're basically outside of their crew cabin in the Russian segment, somewhere in node two, and there's noise caused by IMV fans, exercise equipment. That's integrated over a 16 hour period that affects their hearing risk and communication. Then we stop and say, now there's another issue to deal with, and that is disruption of sleep, and that's an eight hour nighttime exposure. So we have a 16 hours for stuff, eight hours for sleep disturbance, and then we relate this to given tasks. So Jose is gonna to talk to us about how he uses a list of tasks, the noise, how long they're there, to come up with a criteria to say to the crew, you know, if you do this and this and this, overall you're gonna have a high level of exposure over a one a day using these two tools. Next slide. So consequently, here's the exchange rate that we apply, where hearing protection is mandated. If it's above 72 decibels A-weighted, that's how we hear, for 16 hours. But if it's 75, if this gizmo that they're walking around with the noise acoustic decimeter says it was 75, then that exceeded for, we, they have to wear hearing protection if it was more than eight hours. 78 for four, 81 for two. So you see, that's how this is calculated over this 16 hour period. And if it's above 85, we just say, that's, sorry, that's not allowed, you should wear hearing protection. Even if you're just grunting and dashing for a couple of minutes on the, on the treadmill at a high speed, if that's above 85, we recommend hearing protection. It's very conservative. Nobody else in the hearing conservation industry employs a standard like this, but we have very special individuals who put a lot of training in. Next slide. So um, this is actually a backup, but this is where we're headed. We're currently doing um, an UHAD L plus 14 and three. What, we're, what appears to be what's an, an option that's ahead of us, not official yet, but they're, ne we're ne they're negotiating, we're negotiating back to do an UHA uh, after launch one at mid-mission and then an UHA as clinically indicated. If someone says, I, I feel like I've had a change in hearing or the noise levels are shown to be high. So I think the next slide, thank you, Janice, I think that's gonna take it right off to uh, Jose Lamardo, who is the assistant uh, deputy from the acoustics working group. How about the crew one dosimeter? That's measuring the crew exposure on each crew member. Currently we have three dosimeters on orbit, which is the Quest, Right here, which does login data 24 hours, we put it in the morning, run it all day long, go to bed with the same dosimeter. Next day, gives the next crew member, and we do that to all six crew members. And so day one and two, we do crew worn, and then day three, we do static measurement. In that case, we take the dosimeter and place it over a location, say over the T2 or inside the bathroom or by this rack, by this payload, and see what the exposures of that, of that in that area. This is a 24 hour work like I do. We do 16 hours in the daytime and eight hours inside the crew quarters. And then the static measurements, we rotate, like I said, depending on uh, the need or, or, we, or there's something noisy here that we need to investigate. Uh, next slide, please. This, like I said, they do three times, three decimeters. Uh, each crew member wears it. It's an example of one crew member wearing it while he's um, doing some experiments. 
And then at night time, we have to do sleep time. We make sure that they are quiet within their crew quarters at night time. Uh, next slide, please. That measurement, the 24-hour measurement, is the, this is how you explain it. This just goes, this is the daytime. So it goes all around, from, depending where they are located. This particular measurement above the hazard level is when the crew member is running at fast speed in the treadmill. So we identify that. Once I get the data, I don't want to get the data. We do measurement the whole week. By Friday, I get the data. I go quickly see where our levels are. If I see a peak above the hazard level, I send that email with the data to the crew surgeon. He'll go to the flight to the crew member and ask him, okay, what were you doing that time, that day? So we try to pinpoint back and identify those locations and activities that can harm going above those levels. We're not that lucky many times because we do have a schedule the crew supposed to follow, which they don't follow. They just do as needed. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint those locations. So with good feedback from the crew member and through the crew surgeon, we do get a database that we built. That, and I'll talk about that more later on. And that helps us identify these locations for future crew members, for future activities that will involve these kind of levels. So this, this uh, lighter blue line is the equivalent of LEQ that Chris mentioned earlier. So if that LEQ is above 72 within that 16 hour period, he should have one crew um, hearing protection during these activities. For example, if he would want protection here, this level would have gotten lower. So these levels do not represent wearing hearing protection, just represent what he's been exposed to. On the sleep side, because two, it is, we try to keep it within at least below 50 to be a nice rest on, on the ears. The 62 dBA, that means um, we see many crew members that goes above those levels, and that has to be either has his fan on high or has the door open, and, or has, well, listen to some music or somehow, I don't know what it is, but the levels could go beyond that. Or sometimes it could be the fan inside the IMV could be clogged or stalling and make those levels higher. So we'll, the crew member, uh, through the flight surgeon, will let them know, hey, you need to either wear hearing protection at night or close your door because your levels are, are higher. So we get that feedback from the crew member. Next slide, please. Now, each of those, each of this dot represents one of those crew-worn measurements for 16 hours. The red ones are, all, are the levels of crew members that spend most of the time in the Russian segment, and the blue squares are the, are the crew members that spend most of the time in the U.S. segment. As you can see here, um, the trend is all over the place. It's not a quickly a good trend. It is quieter. As this, I'll, I'll go for, I'll take that back. From increment 17 to currently increment 48 right now we are. Uh, we don't got anything below that. We do have data, but this data represents the logging data, new dissimilars that we have to log data. Prior to that, we didn't have any logging feature. We just had a number. 16 hours, this was, this was your LEQ. So we had no idea the peaks that were occurred during the daytime. With this feature that we have in this new dissimilar, we can identify those, those peaks and protect the crew member even better. Well, this, this one just tells you that if your dot is above this orange line, you are required to wear him protect doing those activities that can go above those levels. Above the red line, you never see an LEQ above the red line because that's kind of beyond. But most of the, the time that you are above this 72, you are above the hazard level. And I'll show you the next slide, please. Now that takes a little step further. The, sol the, the, sh the solid lime green color is just the average of, that, of all those crew members within that particular increment. The blue lines are the same thing as those other lines that we had before, the little squares. Now, if it's yellow, it just indicates that that particular crew member had an exposure above the hazard level. Now, if that yellow is with a red border, that means that activity was identified as to be a T2 run. He's running the treadmill and had, was exposed to those levels. Back then in 2014, we had some issues with our wasting hygiene compartment where our pump was going pretty bad and it was pretty loud. It was up to like 90s and that each time they flushed the toilet, thing would spike up. That's where hearing protection. So we identified those three crew members within that time frame were above those hazard levels. And then these triangles within those squares, within those round um, yellow dots, represent a crew member working behind in the service module with the panels removed, working behind, and it's pretty noisy. But we have identified this location through the crew members, so we identify, and then those activities, like I said, are, are uh, built up in this database called the Nose Hazard Inventory, or NHI, and we, 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 those NHI get uh, modified and get um, changed depending if there's any activity that could 
modify those activities. For example, during that time frame where we had the waste hygiene compartment, that activity or that location was placed inside the NHI. So the crew member knew when he goes inside to use the toilet, he needs to put on hearing protection. And then we got that fixed, and then that went, we removed that item from the NHI. So right now, currently, the, the treadmill is one of the items that is there. And we are getting something better to put some blankets around the treadmill to make it a quieter. Because each time they run at high speeds, it's very loud. Even though you're not running, but you're walking by the treadmill, you get exposed to those levels. Next slide. I have a question. Sure. So this shows them in doing the work. They got the dosimeter yes. on. And where they have been doing some work that's put them outside of the, the level of comfort. Exactly. This doesn't tell you whether they put on the protection. Not. It does not at all. Okay. Because the microphone's on your collar. Right. But what we try to do is teach and train the crew member when we have this NHI is that to when to wear. If you're going to be running a treadmill, it's going to be loud. If I'm going to be working behind the panels, I should wear one. But most of the time, uh, and that's a, that's a good lead into my next thing, is that uh, we get the data after the fact. So hey, by the way, you should have warning protection because you were doing this activity, or this new activity that came up, that, or this new noisy payload that we don't have no clue about. Next slide, please. What I try to do here is, this is what we had identified so far. This is right, there's still 58% of those yellow dots and we don't have no clue what's going on. We just know this majority right now is US crew members who are being exposed to those levels, has a level that we don't know what's happening. One thing that we're proposing to come up um, pretty soon, next slide please, is little, this little badge, it's called the noise has a level indicator. And what it does, come bar real quick. The crew member will wear this, not all the time, just when he will need it. If he's gonna be working at some activity or by a location, he just, you turn it on, it stays green all the time. That means you are below the 85 dBA, so you're fine. But if you start yelling or making louder or, or, or this light turns red, that means you, sh you are in some location where you are required to wear hearing protection. This is a quick fix to identify in that location that you are required to wear hearing protection. And it's, you can shut it off, you don't have to be in this annoying light all the time, but you use it. I'm gonna work behind the panel, I'm gonna wear this. So this gives you a quick indication, don't wait for me to give them the data back. Hey, you should have one hair protection. At least you have some indication that you should wear it. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool tool. Pretty cheap too. And it's rechargeable, so you could use it, and it works up to 200 hours without being charged at all. So it's pretty lightweight. And right now we're trying to get it certified and have it up in orbit for the crewmen to wear and use. Next slide, please. Now, what I showed you before is, is the work time. Now during the sleep time, let me just show you some historical data from the, the funny triangles there are the Cuyutas, and all the other ones are just the crew quarters. It could be, the tr all the other ones are just crew quarters within the, the station. We have, the, we have four, the overhead, the deck, the starboard and port, and then we have some other location we had initially. And they show that some, some trend, and like majority, the ones that go above those levels are the Cuyutas, are a little bit louder, they're in a louder environment, and and, we, and they have some quiet ones, very quiet ones. And, and these are, as I see it in my data, it's all crew dependent. It's not really the location, the facility, because they have, we have some crew members that sleep in the Cayuta and they're pretty quiet. Because they probably put the fan on low, they shut the door down, so it's pretty quiet. And we got some crew members on the US side, which is quieter, but they have a lot of, they have their fan real loud, they have the doors wide open, so it's all crew dependent, so. And, and, and their preference, how they like to sleep. Next slide, please. And it's the same data as I showed before. I just show you the average. So um, we have some peaks, and when we have these peaks of within average, we have a lot of commuter measurements above those levels. So we know this: the the Russian data is pulling out the U.S. data above. So you see those peaks and valleys, and there are, and like I said, this is just indication that it's, it's, all over, it's all over the place. It's not really a, a nice trend. But if I, if I show some trend beyond that, the commuter has gotten quieter over the time. They have shut. They have quiet it down and, and the crew members know when to wear hearing protection and when to shut the door down, make it lower, make it comfort for you to sleep. Next slide, please. Now, um, with all this data, we have to do something with it. Just not just get the data and here's the information. So we're trying to be a little more proactive. So we have this spreadsheet, we call it the Noise Exposure Estimation Tool. And what it is, is just have all the data of all these locations and we try to 
provide an exposure? What would be your exposure in that location, this activity, if you're doing for this longer, uh, this duration? So what I try to do is, is as populate as much as possible. So when I get those peaks, I try to get as much information from the crew member. Okay, what you were doing? What, how long you were doing this for? And feed it into this because this will help me to develop this this tool. Next slide, please. So what I do, I say, like I say, the crew one data, any static measure, and also SLM data and ground data. Sometimes we have some equipment that we don't have on orbit data yet, so we use the ground data first, and then until we get new measurements, then I replace it. So get modified, get better and better each time. And this will give you an indication when are you where to hear, wear hearing protection while you're on orbit. Do for that activity for this duration. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a float diagram how exactly it all occurs. Like I said, no problem. One back, right here. You get all the data, like I said, on orbit. Um, we put in this NEAT, the tool. If you are a crew member that works more on the Russian side, on the US side, we'll give you some, because the levels are different. When the Russian is a little bit louder. It's a little quiet now, but it used to be a lot louder before in the US side. US side is some locations that are louder too, like Node 3, compared to Columbus module. There's pretty difference there. But this will give you an idea when are you required or when you're recommended with hearing protection. Those are those levels that that Dick mentioned earlier, the 72 dBA and the 60 dBA. That will, that will, once we get this information, once we run this a uh, couple, several times, uh, this will give you a, a noise has an inventory for that particular increment. So what we do, we, we take two increments at a time. Sometimes it doesn't change that much. So we say, for now, I got 47, 48 I'm building right now. I built this increment, I run a couple cases to make sure that my levels are still the same. If we have clock fans, they'll change my level. If I have a, a noisy T2, that would change, or I have a, a bad pump on my, on my waist, waist hygiene compartment, that would change my levels too. So that would be implemented in my in noise hazard inventory. Then I use some data from engineering or medical that we could feed into it, any, any waivers, and that would create a noise hazard inventory specific for that increment that we send to the crew members up there on, on ISS. So they have that tool to know, okay, if I'm doing this activity, that's what I should be wearing here protection or not. Next slide, please. This is just an example of the tool, how it looks like. It's very simple on, 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 on Excel. Uh, these are here where you select the location. It's also, um, I call it, you select, it, it's, it's pull down menus, you put your duration, it'll give you LEQ. Then overall, you feel as much as information as you know. Sometimes you don't have all the, ID, all, that, all the information, but you say, okay, I know three activities that he's doing, three launch activities. So, and, and I know my durations, and I'll give you my LEQ, but I know this crew member spend most of the time in the Russian segment, so it'll give you an average of what his other time will be in the Russian segment, and then that'll give you an overall LEQ for that particular crew member. Next slide, please. This is an example here. This is, a, this is, a, this is what the, the timeline for a crew member looks on, on order for one day. So let's say, take a commander here, let's say A Red, he's working a T2, he did a meal in the Russian segment, let's say, and he's working this experiment here. Uh, next slide, please. And this is his LEQ that I got for that particular crew member, right? He's running, running, the same as before. He's above. He's no, no hearing plugs, assuming no hearing plugs. His LEQ is 73.974, so he should have wear hearing plugs sometime within that 16 hour period. Next slide, please. So, for example, if he wears his hearing plugs, this is what it will represent. It will drop your LEQ because it will be less exposure to the crew member. And even though he's running at that fast speed, he has his plugs in, in place, so his level will be over, roughly around 64 dBA in that location. So if, if you were to know beforehand that this noisy T2 running at high speed would create this level with my plugs, so your exposure actually would be around 64 and not 74 that you had before. It would generate that level, so that way. Next slide, please. The same thing you do with the tool. I identify all my activities that he, he's performing, right? He's running T2 at high speeds, around 85 dBA. Next slide, please. Now, if I change the plugs, okay, this, he, he's running with plugs, it would change my levels there, so he'll, his LEQ would reduce. You could go back and forth. So it could tell you how it just jumps. It tells you here, okay, you're above, you should wear hearing protection. You click it in, and if you wear your plugs, it would drop it. So this is a quick tool based on the data we got from on, on orbit. You could build a quick turnaround, giving an exposure of that crew member. So, for, exa for example, if the crew member wants to do some certain activity for, through a cruise like, okay, can you run it quick? We could run this very quickly. It's simple, and you give them a, 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 an, an idea of what exposure would be for that particular crew member. Next slide, please. 
So, um, like, like I said, with this tool, with our data, and with NHI, we built, like, like Dick was mentioned, we had the 72 for 16 hour and the 60 for, for recommendation, 72 for requirement, that's what we require to wear hearing protection. We have the UHA measurements that now we are trying to link together the symmetry measurement with the UHA measurements to make it a lot easier and more and better interpretation of the data. <clears throat> and, and the key here is to, and one thing is the crew members always have hearing protection on orbit. They have all types, like Dick was mentioned. They have from, from foamies to both headsets. And they are always um, available for them to wear whenever they want to wear them. Next slide, please. Now, what's the NHI? What's the noise has inventory? Remember that database I was talking about? It's just a simple, it's a database. It's exactly activity, which type of crew member, what activity and what location for what duration. For example, the T2 running above 10 miles per hour always requires wearing hand protection. That's just a given. It's not, because you are above the 85. You will hit that peak, by the way. If you're running below that, you have to be at least seven hours and 15 minutes within that time frame to wear hearing protection. So it'll, it'll give you at least a funny feeling of what exactly you need. Or if you have that little noise hazard level in indicator, that will tell you exactly when you need it to wear it. But this is before the, the NHI LL that we have there. Next slide, please. Now this is the same thing, but just for a crew member on the Russian segment. Like I said, the T2 is always required, and then he has other activity within the service module. If he works behind the panel, 204, but for this duration only, he must wear him protect because your levels are pretty high. And most of the time, they are, we are um, through history, each time they work behind the panel, they are required hearing protection on their end. So we just, another indication, because we do see this data, when I got this data back, I see it was above 85 all the time, I said, what's going on here? So the Christian, we found out he was wearing, working behind the panel, but he, but he was wearing hearing protection. But at least we know that activity could be in this database. Next slide, please. Okay, I think it's towards the end. Um, like we mentioned, we are having a tour of our facilities this coming Thursday from 1 to 2. We are building 241, uh, room 1000 EF. That's the big, cha big room. Um, and we'll show you all these kind of tools we have there. We'll show you also meet other, other mem members of our team and see our facilities and welcome all you guys there. If we got a time to come there, it's a fun place. We keep it quiet. Any other questions? You can open the door for, for questions. I, I have one. Yeah. Um, the measurements and stuff that you all are taking for when they're on the orbit, do you all also have something built in over in the HERA, for instance, or is all of the ground testing done in, is it 241? On 241 is so how we do our, our testing. So, so, okay, so like over in the HERA, there's no testing that you all are doing well, over in that, I'm I, asking. Well, for the HERA, actually, we are, for this, this coming mission next year, is the 45-day mission, we are proposing a, um, a, a research where we are looking into more, not the hearing loss issues, but the other issues that we talked about, the sleeping, the annoyance, the affecting your performance, uh, even the risk of hypertension. So those are areas we're looking now through the HERA. So the other side, the non-acoustical health effects. But we are, yeah. We are. So that's um, an another side we're looking into. That little, the little uh, bat, the meter that you would wear that tells you green or red. Yeah. So that's that's just for spikes over 85. So if you're doing something at 80 and you have like an hour and a half that you can be at that time, it's obviously not going to measure that. It's not going to measure that. Okay. So you have to be cognizant of just exactly your activity and how long you do it. But if that activity, for example, is, is including our NHI, if he's doing, if it's by T2, for example, and T2, he's not running that fast, but he's, it's around, it's around 80 or 78, probably. But, um, and, 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 and the crew members by themselves, on the crew debrief, they said, T2 is very noisy, it's loud, and they were always hearing protection. So they are, themselves are cognizant about it, but that will give, give you this a quick indication if you're above the hazard level, wear it. But most of the time, when I get the data, and the crew member, um, they are above 72 over a 16 hour. They have been exposed somehow, sometime above 85, most of the time. If you look at this plot here, mm -hmm. the ones above the, the 72 dBA line, that's for the 16 hour work day. You can see that there's very few of them that are above that line that are yellow. All the yellow ones have exceedances in the hazard level. So almost every single one of those dots 
where you're above 72, you also exceeded the hazard level. And if you were wearing hearing protection when you exceeded that hazard level, those dots would probably be below 72. I mean, they may have been wearing hearing protection, but so that just shows that this little noise badge is going to do a really good job of, of telling people when to wear hearing protection, and it's going to help us not be exposed to the hazard level, above the hazard level, but it'll also keep us below 72 for the 16 hour in most cases. We're excited about that because it's going to be offer more autonomy. The crew member will see right now, at this moment, it's, it's higher rather than uh, seeing a subsequent report maybe revealing to mm -hmm. Jose, who then ultimately gets around to reading it and ultimately passes it back up to say, you know, uh, 12 days ago you should have been wearing hearing protection when you were yeah. doing whatever you were doing. And um, we're not, we're not going to ask the crew to wear these things all the time. It's just for them to have, to be able to use if they're wondering, is this level too loud or not? And then they can pull it out and they can use it. Yeah. And we're better. We used to be, uh, we didn't have this knowledge. Back then we had like a number only. You were 75. Okay, what 75 means? 16 on you have 75 LEQ. But at least with this new system, we have at least some idea the levels, the logging feature. And we're getting good, a lot better with the next tool that we're going to get in the future. Short exposure to cloud is to verify, let's say, noise. Is it reversible if you, uh, if it's short period and you checked it and you noticed? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, good is it question. The, so the short durations, if they're very high, they, it may exceed our damage risk criteria. So in theory, according to the equal energy hypothesis, 85 for 8 is the same as 88 for 4, until you finally get to a point where you say, wow, just a, a one minute exceeds the damage risk criteria. When we're talking about extremely loud songs that our soldiers are exposed to, say, howitzers, mm -hmm. or if someone for some reason was um, near an explosion, mm -hmm. uh, that it, the, it exceeds the critical level and the equal energy hypothesis rules is basically goes to outblazes because there's a point where mechanical damage from a howitzer or from a firecracker or an IED explosion for our soldiers, it, it causes, exceeds our abilities, our ears ability to recover. So typically it's an explosion or a high impulse noise um, that's the only, only examples of that. There's a horrible, horrible uh, hobby that people do in their off-duty time caused DB drag racing where they take a cheap Toyota and put tons of gear, audio gear in it, and try to break the world record for sound levels. <laughs> and the world record right now is in Hilton, Brazil, 183 dB SPL, Chris, for a sound source that's um, between 50 and 70 dB. Is that my son's car? <laughs> well, so, so you can be sure if someone was foolish enough to be around that as their hobby, they could exceed these critical levels. That's extremely, remember how 3 dB is a doubling? Mm -hmm. So if we, if we double 85 and double 88 and double 91, but it's a long way to 180. In fact, it's physically, some of us can kind of question, because that's a, that's a bar, that's a. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've got an example that's related to our space flight, and that is with our launch, and then also with our, uh, with our uh, launch abort rockets. So especially with the Orion, where you have the launch abort rockets that are right on top, that's going to be very loud, so we have special requirements for that. Uh, our launch, and, and basically what we're trying to do is, so we have hearing protection with our spacesuits and with the Comcaps communication device, and we want to control any noise to not be louder than 115 dBA for any sustained uh, noise at all. Uh, so we have that in our launch environment. We also have that in our um, EVA, uh, EVA suit environment uh, when the that has to do with the communication in the headset too. So also our communication levels, instead of having volume cranked really high in there, we limit that so that that can exceed 115 dBA. As an example, um, during space flight, uh, we usually don't differentiate between the plugs, but we had one special case with the beam uh, inflation, whereas if there was a, a failure, we have to do an off nominal uh, operation where we went inside the beam and manually Release the air. It was so loud in such an enclosed space that the levels were very high, and so we had to choose our highest attenuation devices on orbit. That, but that's the only only mm -hmm. uh, example that I can remember where we differentiated between. Okay, you can use this one, but not this one. 
So did you know that before they mm -hmm. went? I mean, you yes. had yeah. an idea what that level would be like. Yeah, all that was done before certification of flight readiness. So, it, and, and I'm not even sure that they're going to have to use that. They have an automated way of doing it. That's only in case of, it's an off nominal event. And so, um, so I don't, I'm not even sure they released the air in those tanks yet. So. Any questions? I've got one uh, thing to leave you with. Uh, and uh, I meant to mention it earlier, but I forgot. <laughs> we also had our one-year mission uh, crew member, Scott Kelly, uh, who uh, was up there for a long time, and people tend to get more sensitive to the noise environment the longer they're out there in that environment. And when he came back, he gave a public address uh, and uh, took questions, and uh, we listened and noticed in two areas uh, where he said that uh, noise control is, um, is important, will be um, uh, more important even for longer mission durations to Mars, um, and uh, especially in the sleep stations, he wanted to keep it quiet, and then he also had some comments about uh, the treadmill, the exercise equipment uh, being loud, and that it's more, it's important to do noise control engineering to uh, reduce the noise levels and, uh, and help dick out uh, so we don't have any risk to our hearing. I help them in their risk. <laughs> it's their job. It's their no, we're helping you, Dick. helping me. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so protect your own hearing. If that's yeah. part of the message exactly. as well, that uh, it's a, it's a, this hearing loss we talked about that from noise is uh, irrecoverable. So it's permanent. It's not the kind of thing that's uh, thus far we're not satisfied with pharmaceutical treatments, even among our soldiers that are investigating that. Someone who's been in an explosion, but the best thing to do is to well, number one engineer the noise out in the beginning, and then wear hearing protection when you're walking into that situation. So good luck to you. Yep. One more question. One more question. Autotoxins. Is there any? Mm. Um, are the crew members? Th this is from a more uh, pharmacology perspective. Right. But are the crew members um, warned about or um, prescribed medications specifically that don't affect hearing? And do you know of any medications that are affected by? Oh, I see what you're going. I, I thought you were talking autotoxins that were in the environmental autotoxins, and so. We've, we've worked with toxicology and identified yeah. the list of things that are on that list and we're, we, have, we don't have anything that's, have any, yeah. that would accelerate or be a synergistic action with noise with that effect. And in terms of, uh, of meds, um, a good question. The, the pharmacist is monitoring that as well, those, those side effects. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the real risk of ototoxins for, for the most part are very strong antibiotics. Uh, and uh, maybe some uh, diuretics that uh, are, I don't know that they're even in the, in the med kit. Uh, but, but, uh, Over-the-counter uh, painkillers too? Um, some, like some, some that might accelerate tinnitus. Mm -hmm. um, they're probably, probably to some degree in terms of the dosage they're in the kit. Now you're embarrassing me to say, I'm, I'm not talking to the pharmacist about that. Sure, I wouldn't. But they, uh, Area to look into, man. Yeah, they're, 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 they're attentive. I'm impressed with how closely they monitor everything in that bit kit along the line, but no one's crossed the line to ask me uh, about that. Are, but, are you aware of any synergistic effects no. that may take no. place? No, I'm not. Okay. That's an easy answer, though. I'm not aware of anything. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Personal curiosity there. Sure. I've not heard it's, anything in that area. No. No. Uh, yeah, we have, we have some, some other questions about the, these unusual findings we're finding we're evaluating right now. And it says that the test that we're doing, if you've ever had a baby in the state of Texas or anywhere else in the last uh, 10 years, uh, that baby had their, baby, their hearing screened with a gizmo that was stuck in their ear. Uh, that's basically the measuring a sound that's emitted from the ear. It's emitted, so it's an autoacoustic emission. And uh, that's uh, looking at the integrity of those cells that are in our inner ear, our cochlea, uh, that can be damaged by noise or other agents. Uh, and we're using that now. That was done on in the... Um, uh, fluid shift study. We're evaluating that, and that's what uh, the, our interns and my colleagues at Wiley are evaluating right now. Is is this tool looking at some non-invasive way of monitoring the stiffness uh, and extra fluid pressure inside of the head due to microgravity shifts in the cephalic region? And so um, there is an autoacoustic emission test that's being done. Uh, four crew members have done it on flight now thus far. Two are doing it currently, and of course the two-year, the one-year mission did it. We have more, more coming, so uh, that's a, 
it's a, a very, very intriguing and um, some real groundbreaking work that uh, my interns are working in right now with our colleagues uh, in the University of College London and here at Wiley. Okay. Right. Let's see all. if it's raining, huh? Mm -hmm. see. All right. So as we leave, Ruby is bringing me the sheet so that I can let you all know. There's still some people haven't signed before. Oh, okay, yes. Before you leave, please make sure that you sign uh, the clipboard uh, so that she can go in and give you a, your uh, credit for your attendance.